Good morning uh, and welcome everyone to our 2021 DFCM conference and uh, Walter Rosser Day. I'm David Tannenbaum, DFCM's interim chair. Thank you for taking, uh, taking the time to join us today. Um, before we begin, I want to acknowledge the very difficult week uh, we've been experiencing collectively, but also most acutely within the Indigenous community. The discovery of the remains of 215 children in a mass grave on the grounds of a former Indian residential school in Kamloops, BC has shocked us all. And it's been painful to learn that there will likely be more discoveries of this sort. I'd like to draw your attention to an article written by Dr. Suzanne Shush, our Indigenous Health Lead. It was published two days ago in the Toronto Star, and it's entitled, Seven of My Grandfather's Siblings Lay in Residential School Graves. The 215 children found confirms what Indigenous people have known about Canada. This is a deeply personal and very powerful piece. And in it, Suzanne calls for healing through structural justice. And we've put the link to the article in the chat and I encourage you to read it. We've also seen division, fear, and feelings of being unsafe on the part of learners faculty members and others in our communities over the last few weeks in relation to the polarizing Israel-Gaza conflict. Statements and harsh words have triggered uh, emotional responses based on personal and family experiences of discrimination and violence. Intolerance and insensitivity have no place in our department or on our campus. I hope we can find ways to listen to each other and be deeply mindful of the unintended hurtful consequences of our words and actions. If we're going to help each other through these difficult times, it will be through determined effort to listen, to learn, and to put differences aside in the service of safety and elimination of fear and the maintenance of, coll of collegial relationships to allow us to focus our efforts and fulfill our collective responsibility to help our patients, our communities, and each other. Our responsibilities towards our patients and our communities have perhaps never been more evident than during the COVID pandemic of the past 15 months. I doubt many of us would remember a year that has demanded more. On top of virtual care and teaching pivots and heavy clinical loads, DFCM faculty residents and many other primary care providers have stepped up to run testing clinics, deliver vaccinations, build vaccine confidence, and reach out to and advocate for communities most at risk. And our residents have provided outstanding service in our hospitals and embraced requests for redeployment to the greatest degree. I wanna thank you all for your efforts. They are deeply appreciated by everyone. True to the events of the last year, today's conference looks a little different from what we expected. Not only are we meeting virtually, but uh, as you know, we're presenting an abridged agenda in light of the crucial role that family doctors play, are playing in the vaccine efforts, but also uh, in dealing with the realities of our personal lives and those of our families. We hope that today's shortened conference allows you some protected time for yourselves. Uh, we will have the pleasure this morning of hearing from Dr. Ross Upshur on uh, what we can hopefully learn from this and other pandemics, and Dr. Karen Tu, who will offer a global view of how the pandemic how the pandemic has affected primary care. Thank you to Ross and to Karen for agreeing to address our DFCM community today. And thank you very much to the planning committee um, and to our conference chair, Dr. Viola Anteo for bringing us together and doing such a beautiful job. Um, before we turn to our speakers, I'm gonna welcome Kat Krieger, an indigenous elder and indigenous advisor for U of T's Mississauga campus to start the, the proceedings. And then Kat's remarks will be followed by a land acknowledgement offered by Viola. So thank you and Kat, over to you. Regret, uh, David, thank you very much. So the first thing I'm gonna do is start us off with a traditional smudge, because that's the way many indigenous peoples um, will begin a meeting, will begin a gathering. Sometimes begin our day, sometimes end our day. And for those of you that have not smudged before, I have a beautiful abalone shell here. 
<clears throat> there's some traditional sage in it, some white buffalo sage. And part of this is, it's part of our well-being. There's smoke that comes up from that that has a, a beautiful smell to it. And I always waft it towards my computer screen, but I know you can't smell it. But one day we'll come back together and we'll do this again. There's a metaphoric washing of the hands, taking some over the eyes, the ears, breathing a little bit in um, over our heart, uh, over our body, as it were. And there's a, as I say, a spiritual component to that, that we're taking a moment to cleanse ourselves, to bring us together of one mind. And that one mind today is this, this focus on these things that we're talking about. And that includes compassion and kindness. When that smoke, uh, comes up, it reminds us of something. In the words of one of my Mohawk elders that I learned from, the smoke shall pierce the sky. And what that meant, that metaphor talks about our prayers, our thoughts, our wishes, the work that we're doing, all those things will always be heard. There's no barrier to them. This, this smoke, this smudge, the, the spirit of it doesn't know bandwidth, it doesn't know um, tech issues, it knows no barriers like that. It goes as far as it needs to go. And I think in all of our belief systems, there is something where we take a moment to center and ground ourselves. So this is one of the ways that I do it. We think, uh, and when we do our work, when we go back out to do our work, we think that everything we touch, we're going to touch with our hearts. We're going to look at things with our hearts. We're going to think about what we're doing with our hearts. Um, and very importantly, we're going to listen with our hearts to the ones we're helping, the ones we're working with, with each other. Because words are gifts. That knowledge is gifts and our experience is a gift and helps us deal with what's coming in the future. So, Wayne Bojo, Tansi, Sego, Makwa Gishdad, Indigenous Pods, Jikan Dodo, Kyugan Dunjaba, Kyuga Mishnabe, Miwa, German, English, and Dal, Mambe Majada, Ujibwa, Bida, Dan, Gene, Gegomi, Nige, Nige, Goba, Miguet, Skobini, Kwe, Miwa, Manado, Gisis, Manado, Nokness, Miwa Kichibumi, Mide, Wabo, Mui Shaganals, Shushibangi. That last little bit means I'll speak English. That's the language that we're sharing right now, today, here in this space. That uh, my spirit name is Makwa Gishka, which means sky bear, or maybe uh, sun bear. The translation varies a little bit. I'm Kayugan, the Six Nations of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. That's my dad's side. Uh, you know, originally his people came from the Cayuga Lakes that were, are in the, what is now called upstate New York. My mom is German English, so I have these three different ancestral roots that I carry with me and I honor the best I can. Her people came from the south, uh, east, southeast of England, as well as the southwest of Germany. These are the lands that I come from. More about those words, it talks about something that's important to all of us, about the sun coming up this morning and reminding us of what we need to do to go through life. That sun comes up, it does its path across the sky and sets in the west. And it does something each and every single day, whether we can see it or not. It brings light, it brings warmth, and it brings life to everything around us. And I think that's a guiding principle as, as humans, as healers, as people, and all the work that we do. It also talks about the moon, uh, reflecting that light, doing that symbiotic dance with the sun and softening that light. It brings in a kindness and gentleness to that light. That silver light reminds us of the the silver hair of our ancestors, the knowledge keepers, our grandparents. And the moon always has the same face towards earth. Again, I think this is important in the work that we do. It never changes the direction that it looks. Even though it's spinning, earth is spinning, the moon's going around the earth. We're all going around the sun and we're describing actually a spiral path through the galaxy that we're in. That moon is always watching over earth. And that's an inspiration to all of us when we look towards what it is we need to do in our work. And that we are, in a sense, life preservers and life givers. The water, that last part that talks about the, the big waters to the south of us. I'm up here in Brampton right now. So I think of the, the you know, Lake Ontario, that beautiful lake, um, but also all the waters around us for their life giving ability. We as humans need water to survive. That's, uh, that is the, the primary thing. We start our life in that womb, in that water. We spend nine months there. We listen to the heartbeat of our mother and that's where our music comes from, that steady beat of music that we, um, we hear over and over and over again. And we begin our first journey into this world on that water. So today when you look outside and it's raining, uh, maybe the weatherman, I have a pet peeve, 
the weatherman goes, oh, it's a terrible day out there, it's raining. That's almost culturally inappropriate. This water has traveled all the way from the lakes to come up and touch us. And as, as healers, as doctors, as, as people within the fields we work in, that you work in, uh, it's reminding us what is essential for life. Even those tiny drops of water are so important. So all these things coming together that we honor all those things and also recognize that sun's reminding us that life is cyclic. It has a beginning, it has an end. As it travels through space, it reminds us of that. That our work is cyclic. We go through our day, our day ends. We know the next day we get up, it's gonna be there waiting for us. And yet we'll go through that path and that journey. So we're grateful for the sun for reminding us of that important, that responsibility that we all carry. I also recognize uh, this place and space and time that we're in. David, you mentioned the, the 215, uh, the grave site of the 215 children that were found and the, the, the horror of that history. And I encourage at some point today, um, you know, if we, if we take a second for each child, I think it works out to three minutes and 35 seconds, three minutes and 50 seconds. Sorry, my math is lousy this morning. Um, but one of the schools I worked with, the children took time to wait out a second for each of those children in silence. And what it translated into is a heartbeat for each and every one of them, to remind us of that heartbeat of each and every one of them, and what they may have contributed to where we are. And the, the idea of taking lives versus preserving lives, the amount of work it takes to preserve life, the amount of work it takes to, get, to be the ones who carry wellness um, as a gift. And I think when I, every time I look at a healer, every time I look at a doctor or a nurse or anybody within that, that realm, I'm thinking, here's, here are people who are devoting their life to sustaining life, to continuing life, to helping life. And that's a huge responsibility. That's a huge amount of work. And it doesn't stop. There's, there's no day off, it seems. There's no time out because it's a full-time job. It's also important that ourselves, this vessel that we walk in, this, this sacred gift that we, we walk, we talk, we play, we live, we work, we touch, we can be touched, we can love, we can be loved. This is an important thing to preserve and it is certainly uh, a wonderful gift to have. And what do we do with this gift, this, uh, this vessel that we walk in? And certainly providing healing to others, to me is one of the, one of the highest levels of what we are as people as humans, that we speak from our hearts with the ones we're working with, that we, we touch with our hearts, we look with our hearts, and we listen with our hearts to the ones we help. It's a difficult time. It requires that we adapt. And I, I always think along indigenous lines, that's just how I am. And, you know, as, uh, as humans, we're, we're, I kind of look at human design and think we, we, we kind of got the short end of the stick. We don't have very big claws, we don't have very big fangs, we don't have much fur, we walk upright. That's a pretty lousy balanced concept. It was the animals, we say, that taught us to survive. And it was the coyote that taught us adaptability. So my message to you today is, in a sense, to be coyotes. They can live in the far south in the deserts, they can live in the far north in the snowlands, they can live in downtown Toronto, but they always adapt to the environment they're in. They look around and see what it is they can use to survive, what it is that you can use to thrive. And if you've ever seen the coyotes down in the park sometimes with their little pups, they're playing, they're enjoying life. They're in a different situation, they're in a different place and time, but they still have that time to take out to be happy. And I think with the work we're doing, maybe from our hearts that will bring in this idea that even in challenging times, that we find time to look into our hearts, to touch, to work with, to, um, to heal those around us, and in a sense, healing ourselves. So I could talk for hours, but there's, I'm not learning anything while I'm talking. And here's an important thing for today. If I listen, I'll learn something. Those of you that are speaking or sharing a gift with the others. And that devotion of life, we honor you for that. There's an old style when we go out to harvest things, when we go out to hunt, we make an offering. We are asking animals, we're asking plants, we're asking everything around us to take time out of its own world to sustain our life. And that's what we're doing. So I offer those few words of encouragement. 
I also offer my own thanks. When I saw the picture for the conference, I thought the person sitting in a chair being tested. I was sitting in my car. Um, we waited for a long time for the people doing that hard work. They were outdoors that whole time. Remind me of a mass unit. Some of us who are a bit older will know what that means. That idea of working in any element under any conditions and still helping people to survive. So my thank you to all of you. Miigwech for listening to my word. Thank you, Kat, for bringing us together for such an important moment of reflection. I also want to thank you for advising that it's customary to be and respectful for the land acknowledgement to be preceded with some heritage and background about the speaker who is conducting the land acknowledgement. So for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Viola Anteo. I'm the Director of Faculty Development uh, at DFCM and the Chair of um, the DFCM Conference Planning Committee. More importantly, I am the mother of two awesome sons and soulmate to my husband, John, and sister to seven older siblings. I am blessed to have been born in East Africa and I feel so very fortunate that as a child, my parents chose Canada as the country to seek refuge and call home. As a visitor, I would like to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this island. I'm very grateful today that we are able to gather and to hear from Dr. Ross Upshur and Karen Tu. I'm excited to hear what they say. So a few uh, housekeeping items first. During the presentations, please do submit questions to our speakers using the Q&A function. Instructions uh, on how to do this are on the slide. You'll also be able to see other questions that have already been submitted. So please like or upvote the questions you want answered. Please try and avoid putting questions in the chat, uh, as this will not be monitored closely for questions. It's mainly uh, to be used as a networking uh, tool. These sessions are being recorded and will be made available on the conference website after the event. I'm excited to introduce our keynote speaker for the Walter Rosser lecture. He needs no, in no introduction. But Dr. Ross Upshur, who will speak about pandemics, past, present, and future, what can we learn? Ross is professor at DFCM, chair in clinical public health at the Dalalana School of Public Health, scientific director at Bridgepoint Collaboratory for Research and Innovation, and associate director of the Lunenfeld Tannenbaum Research Institute at Sinai Health. He is a leading voice throughout this pandemic. I also want to welcome Dr. Jeff Kwong, who will be moderating the session. Jeff is also a professor in the DFCM, a scientist with Public Health Ontario, and senior scientist with the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences. So with that, I'd like to welcome everybody and welcome Ross and Jeff. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Viola, for that very kind uh, introduction. It's a really uh, incredible honor and privilege to be the speaker today, and particularly for the Walt Rosser uh, lecture. Uh, Walter has been uh, uh, incredibly influential in, in helping me in my career and has been a, a, a driving force in academic family medicine, for which we're all grateful. I'm also exceptionally pleased to have uh, Dr. Kwong as uh, my moderator. Uh, he has, I was teasing him earlier that uh, we should switch places and he should do the keynote, uh, given the absolutely pivotal role uh, he has played with his team in developing real-time information to help us make uh, 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 wise decisions as we uh, navigate this pandemic. So without further ado, I'm gonna get started and uh, Here's the title, 
and uh, my past, present, and future. What, and I put in brackets, can we learn? And you'll understand why I've phrased it this way as we move through the presentation. I'm also looking to everyone in the audience to sort of help me in the sense-making process of what we've experienced uh, over this past uh, 16, 17 months. So my disclosures, I do receive grant support from various funding agencies for research. I've done a little bit of speaking for Jewel in the past. I work with a global uh, group of consultants uh, uh, occasionally. Uh, I do get paid by Sina Health and the Dalana School of Public Health. Um, I have been working with the World Health Organization uh, over the past, uh, since January actually of uh, 2020, uh, co-chairing one of their uh, working groups, looking at some of the issues in ethics, and uh, then more recently working on the ACT Accelerator uh, and governance issues that most of you know, the ACT Accelerator through COVAX, which is the global vaccine distribution mechanism. Uh, we'll maybe get a little bit into that as we go along. So it's a great pleasure. Thank you, Viola, for the invitation. Uh, thank you, David, for your uh, introdu introduction words. And thank you, Kat, uh, for such a lovely uh, framing of how we should be thinking about uh, things. And I'm going to take up your offer uh, in a minute, as you will see. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest, but as I often say, I have many conflicts with interests. Uh, I try to make my uh, mind known uh, when I think things are uh, not moving in the direction I think they should or improperly uh, justified. So here's an outline of what I'd like to uh, cover today. I did want to start with a moment of reflection. We'll come to that shortly. Then I want to engage you in a thought experiment, which I hope isn't too lame or, 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 or uh, because there's some thinking that I think that needs to be done the bulk of my presentation will be devoted towards this notion of learning lessons. How do we learn lessons and have we failed to learn lessons? And I'm going to point a little bit gesturally to the future. Uh, I won't say a, a whole lot uh, of concrete things because I think there's something that we have to uh, engage collectively in and have many discussions about what a post-COVID world would look like, whether we'll ever be in a post-COVID world, uh, and how we're going to either return to normal if normal is desirable, or reconceive a future that has different possibilities and where those possibilities may lie. So it'll be fairly schematic. Uh, this is my omnibus apology slide that I like to start uh, with. So I struggled with this uh, uh, talk. I wasn't sure whether I was the right person to be giving the talk, whether my voice was the voice that needed to be heard at this time, uh, given everything that David has said in his introduction and everything that uh, Kat uh, raised. Um, there's no way in the ensuing 45 minutes I'm going to say everything I would like to say. There's no way I'm going to cover every aspect of the pandemic and our experience. And my own particular personal experience has not been representative of, I would say, most of us in the Department of Family and Community Medicine. I haven't had to pivot a practice to virtual. I've spent a lot of time uh, at a different table thinking about this pandemic from a different perspective. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, I also apologize for the fact that we're actually here discussing a pandemic and Jeff might share my thoughts as someone who's been involved in pandemic preparedness and uh, you know, preventive medicine. This was not supposed to happen. It shouldn't have, uh, you know, nobody, our, our goal was to spare the globe from a truly global pandemic. So with those uh, shortcomings in mind, uh, I'd like to start. So I did want to take a moment to reflect, and I, I do uh, want to take Kat's request seriously. I was going to give us uh, 60 seconds to just think about some of the points and the numbers there, but I really do think that uh, the full three minutes and 35 seconds to honor uh, each of the children, uh, you know, one beat of uh, one second for each child would be in order. So I'm just gonna start my clock. Three minutes may seem like a long time, but it's not. I want you to sort of take a look at those numbers and some of the points at the bottom and just have a gather a moment also about your own uh, experiences, uh, your own narratives. So let's just pause for a few minutes to reflect and then I'll start.
thank you. Uh, as I watched uh, the seconds tick by, I thought of the names of the families as a father, unfathomable to me. So to the pandemic, I'm not sure how many of you follow ProMed, uh, but it's a listserv that was started by Stephen Morris, a virologist in the United States. It's a program on emerging infectious diseases, something I followed uh, religiously for years. In fact, uh, during the 2003 uh, and, uh, SARS outbreak here in Toronto, it was the most authoritative source of information. Uh, so if you're interested, I suggest you uh, uh, subscribe to it. If you don't, uh, it also covers uh, diseases in the plant and animal kingdom. And we'll talk a bit about One Health towards the end. But I remember clearly uh, when this came through because it sort of had hints and uh, over uh, tones of uh, an experience we had in 2003. So we've had now, here's where we've been since that time. Uh, my understanding of a pandemic was it was the emergence of a novel pathogen or the reemergence of a pathogen uh, for which there was no population immunity. So we had universal vulnerability uh, and it had potential for global spread. And I think this understanding of a pandemic dramatically underestimates what uh, SARS-CoV-2 has actually represented. So on the top there, you see the time series of the seven day average for Canada. Uh, it's almost quaint now to look back uh, a year ago at that first wave, uh, which seems modest when compared to the second and the third. We're now on the downslope of that third wave and hoping very much that we don't have a fourth and we know what we need to do. Uh, the bottom right has the global case count. And so one of the interesting things about uh, the pandemic is it's gotten people interested in epidemiology in graphs and curves. And one of the ways we've tried to make sense of this pandemic is through the mediation of forms of presentations of data. So we can look at it visually and we see these with modeling figures. And we can look at it in terms of tables. And this is just a simple uh, breakdown of Ontario, the experience of Ontario, the impact of Ontario in terms of cumulative cases. And we see there that the, uh, it's been equal opportunity between males and females, and that it's actually been fairly uh, widespread throughout the, uh, all of the age groups. And we could look at this by even finer bands and finer uh, uh, ways of looking at things. But we've also been uh, interested in severity and mortality. We can see that uh, of the cases that have been reported, about 1.6% have been fatal. And we, we know that there's been a disproportionate effect of mortality and morbidity in older adults, uh, which is rather characteristic of many uh, viral pathogens and respiratory pathogens, but it doesn't have the J shape. So, so far, uh, younger children have uh, been uh, spared. We can also start to, and here's where I want to sort of open things up for a uh, deeper thought. So what is SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19? What is this pandemic? And when you start to do searches, if you look at SARS-CoV-2, you know, we're now all familiar with this vision or this uh, picture of a spiky virus. We've learned a lot about ACE2 receptors and receptor binding domains. Uh, we've talked a lot about antibodies and antibody response. There's been a huge investment in biomedical understanding. Uh, we're keen to understand better the origins of this uh, virus. And that's a, still a live discussion. Uh, there's you know, some strong evidence that it comes from bats through some sort of intermediate host to humans. And we all remember the concern at the beginning that it might've emerged from a wet market in Wuhan. It's also had some interesting social cultural uh, impacts. So we've started to see signage of creative ways. So, you know, down in, in our neighborhood, you've got this, you know, do your part, stay three geese apart. Uh, people have been back obsessed with hand sanitizer, masks of various stripes, uh, you know, an early run on toilet paper and a particular mania for baking sourdough. 
And I, anybody could kind of, when I started to curate the images from the pandemic, it could go on and on. So one way of understanding the pandemic is through uh, numbers, through data, for those who are scientifically inclined, we can start to look at this visually. These are memories or reminders of what's been past. We also know that it's had a dramatic uh, social cultural uh, and socioeconomic impact. Small businesses have been affected. Schools have closed, and I know many people in attendance today are parents of young children. Uh, it's hard enough raising children with a busy clinical practice uh, with the schools open. I cannot imagine. I've uh, often reflected on my good fortune that my uh, children are adults. Uh, I understand the stress and strain that this has posed, the pivoting of practice, uh, the disruption to travel, uh, the closure of business. Almost every aspect of our uh, humanity has been touched by this pandemic. And of course, the healthcare impacts have been uh, quite dramatic, as we would know when we'll hear a bit more from Karen, uh, the massive shift to virtual care, uh, the way in which uh, uh, all of us in this department have uh, pivoted our own work to work in assessment centers and to uh, start to help out with vaccinations. This notion of the curve flattening, and the question I really want to focus on at some time after this is, what does this dotted line represent? When we were trying to protect health system and healthcare system capacity, who were the constituent elements of that? Was it just critical care and acute care? Because when you flatten the curve, the area under the curve remains the same, but it actually shifts into the community. And we saw the devastating consequences of that as we emptied uh, hospitals to prepare to care for people in the hospital, uh, placed them in long-term care facilities where we did not adequately protect them. Uh, and we need to think about that. Also the surge capacity of uh, intensive care I did a lot of work on uh, triage protocols, which is a very, very difficult uh, uh, subject to uh, even entertain that you would be so overwhelmed uh, with need that people who would otherwise require care would be denied it for whatever reasons that we would try to articulate. So here's the thought experiment, and I hope it's not too cheesy and lame. So imagine, you know, you're at the office, a new patient shows up and they're adamant. They don't want to see a trainee. Go, oh, come on. We're an academic practice. You have to be willing to see the residents. They're not in your catchment area and they don't have OHIP coverage. And so you sort of go, oh, my God. And they only, you know, you think, well, what if I have to refer them and they don't have an OHIP number? And they say, no, absolutely refuses at any uh, context to be referred to a specialist only requires, the only person that can help them is a family physician who provides comprehensive care. So who is this patient? So let's imagine it's the planet Earth. And uh, this conceit uh, came up. I teach a course with uh, Erica DiRiggiero and uh, Solomon Benatar at the Dalalana School. It's on now on planetary and global health ethics. And uh, Professor Benatar made the observation that in order to understand COVID, we need to think like a physician and we need to treat the planet as our patient. So I'm inviting you now, as we go through this, to offer up a diagnosis, a treatment, and a prognosis. Uh, and we'll come to those towards the end of the talk and see what you have to say. And I'm gonna save them and maybe uh, write a little piece uh, uh, on, on our thoughts about this. So typically when we do a diagnosis, we start with the history. So I'm gonna move now into a little historical excursion to illustrate some of the points I'd like to make. I'm very fond of the work of the French philosopher, Albert Camus. Uh, I often use Sisyphus as uh, my kind of hero, the man who, or person who thanklessly uh, pushes a rock up to the top of a hill for it only to return back to the bottom uh, and to do that for all eternity. And, some days it sort of reminds me of the labors of a physician. He wrote a book called The Plague that I was encouraging people to read early on because he actually quite astutely uh, illustrates many of the existential uh, uh, situations that we find ourselves in when we're locked down. But of course, as we started to live the narrative, uh, it became uh, less of a, uh, an imperative to read it. But he makes two very astute observations that I would like to highlight. One, he argues, everybody knows that pestilences have a way of recurring in the world, yet somehow we find it hard to believe in ones that crash down on our heads from the blue sky. 
And he further says, uh, there have been as many plagues in history as wars in history, yet always plagues and war take people equally by surprise. And that's a question I want to uh, engage in, in a little more depth. So I want to start with this report that came out just a couple of weeks ago at the uh, World Health Assembly last year, the WHO commissioned an independent panel uh, to look at pandemic preparedness and response. This is a global uh, perspective. Uh, it has a summary report. If you want the brief, I encourage everybody to read this. I also encourage you to take a look at the 16 technical papers. One of them is on health systems. There's one on human rights. Uh, they're really, if you're interested in global health and pandemics and how this happened and how we can have it not happen again, uh, you can take issue with some of their recommendations, but it's actually an excellent report and a perfect uh, point of departure. So make it the last pandemic is their claim. So here's the, what they say, one of the key uh, com comments they make. The world cannot afford to focus only on COVID-19. We've got to learn from this crisis and prepare for the next one. Otherwise, we've you know, wasted our time more or less. That's why our recommendations focus on the future and I invite everybody to start thinking about the future. They claim that COVID has been a terrible wake up call. So now we need to wake up and commit to clear targets, additional resources, new measures and strong leadership to prepare for the future. And as they say, we have been warned. And the former Pride president of Liberia, Sirleaf said, the situation we find ourselves in today could have been prevented. In other words, it ought not to have happened. An outbreak of a new pathogen became a catastrophic pandemic. Uh, it continues to threaten lives and livelihoods all over the world due to a myriad of failures, gaps and delay, partly due to failure to learn from the past. So how far back in the past do we have to go to learn our lessons? Well, we can go very far in the past indeed. So here's a quotation from uh, Thucydides' account uh, of the plague of Athens in his history of the Peloponnesian War. And I focus on, on, on his comments uh, about physicians. He said, physicians were at first uh, not much service. They didn't know a proper way to treat the disease, nor did they, and they died themselves the most thick, sick, thickly, pardon me, as they visited the sick most often, nor did any human art succeed any better. Supplications in the temple, divinations and so forth were found equally futile till the overwhelming nature of the disaster at last put a stop to them altogether. We might say, ah, oh, that's, you know, over 2000 years ago. But think of the key uh, epidemiological uh, observations that are here. So who gets sick? People who come to care. And we've seen that with every new pathogen. Physicians and family members are the ones who are most likely to become ill early because they're the ones who come to aid. So we know, and we've known since antiquity, that by virtue of being a physician, by being a healthcare professional, we're putting ourselves in the line of fire. And as I'll point out uh, later, we somehow have lost that narrative when it comes to uh, recruiting and admitting people into health professions. Uh, this is a picture of a leper wearing uh, the garb and carrying the Lazarus bell to uh, uh, tell people that they're coming their way, mostly so that they could turn away from them. And I've used this uh, quotation of the prayer of separation for several years in presentations. Uh, at first, to, to sort of remind people of the kind of ethical and normative dimensions that we put around uh, managing people with infections. But as you read all of you, so if I forbid or command isn't a, a clear uh, indication of normative behavior, I'm not sure what is. But as I reread this now in light of all of our experience during various forms of stay at home orders and lockdowns, the advice given in that prayer of uh, separation seems very similar to what uh, we're being told that no, you, you, you can't touch anything uh, unless it's your own. Don't enter any tavern. Uh, you know, don't go anywhere and touch the rope without wearing a glove. Uh, don't touch anybody else and don't drink and, or eat anything from, except from your own vessel. So the same sort of advice is being given through time. When we come to the plague years, uh, in the plague diaries, Daniel Defoe writes very similarly, echoing uh, Thucydides, the plague defied all medicines, the very physicians were seized with it, men went about prescribing to others and telling them what to do, and they dropped down dead, destroyed by the very enemy directed others to oppose, and this was the case of the several most skillful surgeons. And we've tried things over the past. So we have this notion that somehow smoke and fumigation will clear uh, infection. 
We also have seen the revisiting of quarantine, and this is taken from a newspaper in the late 19th century during a smallpox uh, epidemic, where the idea here is that if the uh, sick people are in the marine hospital and you lock them in, it will keep the uh, uh, disease from spreading in the community. This notion of separating the infected from the uninfected. Now we've seen that uh, with various uh, methods of border closure and, and uh, methods to try to stem the uh, spread of the disease. So I want to come to the more recent uh, uh, past and talk a little bit about SARS-1. And, and we all know now this uh, picture of the plague doctor uh, with his personal protective equipment, gloves, gown, mask, uh, the pointy stick is for the superating uh, buboes, uh, large nests of uh, uh, pus-filled uh, lymph nodes. And the beak is pointy because there's a poultice in there as the ventilation in this time was not great. And of course, uh, separative uh, nodes are rather aromatic. These are two uh, magazine covers from early May 2003, which seem rather prescient because you know, what do we need to know in the new age of epidemics? What's the truth about SARS? How does the virus spread? Is China covering up? How scared should we be? And we navigated and got through that crisis. And again, uh, many healthcare of the modern uh, health is taken from around that time. Not much different except for the absence of uh, a poultice, the absence of a pointy stick and the advent of plastics. So barriers have remained our chief uh, means of personal protective equipment for healthcare providers. After we got through SARS, there was concerns for uh, pandemic influenza. And I've been working on pandemic influenza preparedness uh, since the late 90s and into the early aughts. And around this time, I started doing my first consulting work for the World Health Organization. And you know, at that time, there was a concern that uh, you know, a bird flu pandemic would actually paralyze uh, 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 the uh, economics uh, of Canada and staggering costs uh, to the healthcare system and up to 1.6 million Canadians could die. But that actually didn't happen. H5N1, highly pathogenic avian influenza, remained a scourge and still remains a scourge for uh, bird populations. When it does make ingress into human populations, the mortality is rather high. And on the right here, I have a picture. So there was a, a case of uh, highly pathogenic avian influenza found at the border between Hungary and Romania. And I like to quip, the only people who are at risk are these poor unfortunate gentlemen who are fogging each other with uh, small masks. And I've never actually seen a bird hitchhike on top of a plane there several uh, meters above. H1 influenza happened in 2009, the so-called swine flu, it could be called a turkey flu. It has uh, uh, you know, genetic uh, material that dates back to the 1918-19 Spanish flu. This was supposed to, uh, we had then this discussion that we might actually overflow intensive care units. We might not have the capacity. And again, a headline from the Globe and Mail with a really nice picture of Alison McGeer there. Uh, you know, we're going to have to stock up on ventilators. So this is now 12 years ago. And you can see the questions here, answering your questions on swine flu. Are we ready for the next wave? It might need a billion dollars. And actually now the economic costs of this pandemic are in the uh, tens of trillions, uh, you know, impacting on economic interests, particularly hog farmers and, you know, don't have a flu party, stay, you know, wash your hands, stay away. We had the same sort of issue here, these uh, sort of uh, these little less social distancing in the lineup, but now we have, uh, you know, pent up demand for vaccines and an initial shortage and uh, uh, spurred by uh, concerns around mortality in the population. After 2011, the next major uh, outbreak was the West African Ebola outbreak. At the time, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations and the United Nations Security Council considered it to be the greatest challenge to, the, uh, to global security uh, in the modern era, which seems quaint in light of what's happened with uh, COVID-19. Though we see the same thing, we need to think about global security in the era of uh, COVID-19. Uh, in that uh, crisis, uh, the Ebola crisis, Sierra Leone uh, in, in Freetown, they had the first lockdown of a major metropolitan era 
area in a recent memory. Uh, there was concerns that people were hiding cases, so they shut down the city for three days so health workers could go door to door uh, to try to find cases. And of course, uh, major metropolitan areas in uh, this current uh, pandemic have been shut down uh, with the same sort of uh, effect. Also concerned about survivorship, uh, People from in Liberia and Ebola survivors were had you know long-term sequelae that were fearing uh, reinfection, and we've seen the same thing happen here with uh, COVID-19. And we would be remiss uh, to not mention uh, the MERS outbreak, which is still out there percolating around. And there was a major outbreak in, in Seoul. Uh, and part of the reason attributed to uh, South Korea's effective response is the remembering uh, what happened uh, with uh, uh, MERS. And of course, uh, Zika. And you can tell uh, the theme here about fumigation. Uh, that you know it's a serious pandemic when the media is filled with uh, pictures of uh, people spraying things. Uh, and these are all pictures I called from uh, pictures of stories during the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak. So what about lessons learned? So after Ebola, uh, there was a huge uh, outpouring of uh, publications, uh, major organizations, uh, learning lessons. Bill Gates was given space for a uh, 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 commentary in uh, the New England Journal and in on the front page of the New England, uh, pardon me, of the New York Times, uh, to talk about what the next epidemic and what lessons we need to learn from Ebola. However, uh, this isn't the first time we've been told that we need to learn lessons and we need to wake up. Uh, similar uh, sentiments were expressed uh, over SARS-1 and also over the H1N1 uh, influenza. And we've learned a lot of lessons in Canada, but they're sometimes hard to find. I think they've rectified this, but early on when I went to look for the companion reports on both uh, uh, H1N1 influenza and uh, SARS, uh, the uh, reports were archived and not easily to access. Uh, you could actually have to go to the contact us uh, page. And of course, we're hearing the same thing before even that uh, independent panel that we need to uh, wake up and learn lessons. So I'm not quite sure what's happening here. So a public health emergency of, and this is directly the, the sentence is taken from the independent panel report. A public health emergency of international concern is the loudest alarm that can be sounded by the WHO director general. And, the, after the 2003 SARS out, uh, outbreak, there, after a long negotiation, the international health regulations, which really are the guidance for the global community and member states of the World Health Organization to respond to uh, public health emergencies, such as uh, big epidemics, or uh, in this case, a pandemic. And you can see that since uh, 2014, uh, People forget that polio was, de was declared a fake. We've had uh, West African Ebola, Zika, a second Ebola outbreak, and now uh, the uh, uh, COVID-19. So we've actually had the alarm sounding uh, for about seven years. So after Ebola, I started to reflect upon this is, uh, and came to the conclusion that the most powerful lesson we learn from these uh, exercises is that we actually don't learn lessons or don't like to learn lessons. Um, so we've, we tend to go to sleep uh, over and over again, and uh, we wait for the next outbreak to emerge. So we either have a form of collective amnesia or collective narcolepsy. Uh, or else we just need a, a new alarm clock or a better way of us uh, uh, taking concerted effort when global challenges such as a pandemic arise. Because we've known about this, so if this is the physical examination, uh, this is a, a figure taken from the Institute of Medicine's report on emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases that was published in the early 90s, around the time when I entered into uh, my public health residency. I actually didn't think I was going to be working in uh, infectious diseases. I was interested in environmental determinants of, uh, of cancer. 
uh, but got fascinated, particularly doing my rotations in communicable disease control uh, in infectious diseases, worked in tuberculosis for a while, uh, and got involved in, in the SARS outbreak uh, at uh, the public health level when I was seconded up to York Region. And this lays out uh, a map that tells us exactly how uh, SARS-CoV-2 emerged. You have emergent factors within the microbial population, their capacity to adapt, mutate, vary, respond to uh, selective pressures, and dwell in multiple zoonotic pools. And you'll see zoonosis featuring very heavily in this uh, 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 conceptualization, because most of these newly emerging and re-emerging diseases tend to be uh, come from zoonotic hosts. You see these other emergence factors, so economic development and land use, uh, factors such as demographics, travel, which accelerates. I could have easily put up uh, you know, uh, some of the data from Cameron Kahn and Blue Dot about how uh, air travel fuels the spread of rapid spread of uh, infectious diseases, uh, how it's going, how infrastructure behave, uh, breakdown, human behavior. All of these facilitate uh, the introduction of novel uh, pathogens into a human host wherein they can spread amongst ourselves. And of course, it's not the case that there hasn't been many of these new. So I usually have a slide from, except it's apocryphal that in 1967, the director of the, uh, uh, the Surgeon General of the US said that the, we have to close the book on infectious disease because that era is over. Uh, but you can see just on this timeline at the bottom from 1980, uh, the number of new uh, and, uh, and re-emerging infections that have come to plague the population. This stops at 2012, and since then we've had uh, Zika, two Ebola's, and of course now SARS-CoV-2. And you can see from the map that they uh, can arise anywhere uh, around the world. So we've known this for some time, and the independent panel reflects this. It says, although public health officials, infectious disease experts, and previous international commissions and reviews have warned of potential pandemics and urged robust preparation since the first outbreaks of SARS, COVID still took large parts of the world by surprise, echoing uh, you know, Camus' comment that when these events occur, they seem to take us by surprise. And they say it should not have come. So what's the role of family medicine? I mean, the, the other way of making sense of the world of sense making, I talked about data, I talked about images and pictures, is the importance of narratives. And uh, the family medicine report this year will actually highlight uh, the, the, narr the experiences of many of you uh, and uh, during this pandemic. So I'll leave that to Karen to, to speak about. But the independent panel did note that high performing countries, the ones that seem to get a, a grip on the pandemic, supported primary care. They supported community health workers to actually do screening assessment and referral while continuing to provide ongoing routine and acute care in communities. They also note that uh, this notion of green and sustainable futures in a pandemic free world are being drawn more clearly than ever before. And so this notion that we need to take planetary health seriously uh, has been tabled by the independent panel report. So I'm gonna sort of start to wrap up by looking toward the future. Uh, we do know, as mentioned on, as I pointed out on the slides for reflection, uh, that equity and uh, has played a, a massive role or concerns for equity, how we think about equity, how we understand and measure equity uh, in our own local environment, but also globally, is one of the great challenges. The independent panel does point out uh, the disproportionate effect globally on very, on, uh, you know, populations uh, that uh, suffer from consistent uh, and chronic uh, disadvantage, uh, the important role that the social determinants of health play in modifying the impacts of pandemics. And family medicine uh, has started to turn towards uh, integrating equity and social determinants into its thinking and how we deliver care. Uh, 
uh, massive implications for family medicine research, of which Karen will speak more. We've got much to learn about uh, how we educate our uh, residents and medical students uh, towards future uh, uh, contribution towards uh, uh, pandemic preparedness and response. We know the willingness is there, that's clear and unequivocal, but I think we need to do a little bit more uh, in terms of preparing uh, medical students and uh, ourselves for what it means to be part of a, a pandemic response. And of course, many, many lessons uh, to learn about practice configuration. Uh, we pivoted to virtual, how much of this will be a permanent and how much of this will be a temporary change in how we deliver services and engage uh, our patients. We also need to think a bit about the profession of medicine. I'll speak a bit more about that. And we need to start to really think about health system reform, how we better integrate clinical medicine and public health, and how we start to think about uh, uh, performing as a learning health system. And of course, uh, you're still waiting for your diagnosis and uh, uh, treatment of uh, global health and planetary health. So we've now started to actually use data to understand how disparities uh, emerge and uh, you know uh, colleagues in our uh, department such as Rick Blazer and others have been really uh, focusing uh, locally on pointing out how uh, you know the experience of a pandemic and actually the experience of many uh, health conditions is not uniform across the population. Uh, that these uh, there's intersecting uh, disadvantages uh, that play a role in how disease manifests itself. But it's also the case globally. And this is just the illustration of the vaccination gap that currently exists. Uh, I heard on the news this morning, the head of, uh, the, of CEPI, which is a, an epidemic preparedness uh, network globally, uh, that at our, our current rate, it's going to take uh, years and years, perhaps decades, uh, to immunize uh, the population. Uh, even though a large number of doses have been given, uh, there's uh, 7.8 billion people uh, currently alive and you can see that uh, a vast proportion of the world's population uh, has not had uh, an opportunity to be vaccinated as yet. Uh, and notwithstanding, uh, these are large historical structural issues that relate to uh, neoliberal economies and other uh, large forces that have shaped the kind of experience that we have as a world of this pandemic. I was struck though, a lot of the work I did in the aughts, uh, my first work with the World Health Organization was to uh, co-chair a panel on health worker obligations in a pandemic. So the so-called duty to care issue, uh, because obviously going back to Thucydides, uh, physicians and other health professionals are actually at greater risk of becoming infected because of their proximity to care. And Goddard and Patel in The Lancet pointed out that the impact of COVID-19 has been quite dramatic in, on the medical profession, uh, that there's been a decrease in morale and increase in burnout, uh, an increase in concern about the complexity of patients and the interface with technology. And they state that core principles of medical professionalism, for example, primacy of patient welfare, patient autonomy, and social justice have been challenged during the pandemic. And they challenge us to sort of say, how do we move away from a model of medical professionalism that can lead to moral injury towards one that provides proactive support for professionals in a systematic way and is focused on supporting moral repair. So there's been a large literature emerging around moral injury and moral repair and its impact on health professionals and well-being. I put up here, so uh, in my role as the uh, uh, the division head of clinical public health at the Dalai School of Public Health. When I started in that role in 2013, uh, many people were saying, well, what, what's clinical public health? Isn't that an oxymoron? You've got clinical medicine, you've got public health. And, and many people thought that you shouldn't say these things in the same sentence. So we actually did a Delphi study uh, or a modified Delphi to sort of understand how people thought that this, you know, what clinical public health would look like. And this paper will be coming out in June, I'm happy to announce after a long protracted period. And here's just six Venn diagrams, which depict this, including of course, this. Uh, 
uh, bottom right uh, at, uh, where, where they don't intersect at all uh, to the other side of the coin where it's at the center of the universe of health systems. Uh, my own uh, sense is that it's this uh, healthy intersection between uh, public health and clinical practice and family medicine in particular where we have uh, shared concerns and mandates for uh, prevention, uh, health promotion, uh, and then finally, coming to this notion of One Health. One Health is this idea that uh, uh, we need to take a very concerted look at ecosystem health, at the human inter animal interface, uh, to better understand how environmental degradation and uh, the Anthropocene uh, impacts upon not just the health of humans, but on uh, all uh, organisms in the interconnected web of life that Kat so uh, uh, beautifully described at the beginning, how we move towards thinking uh, a little more differently about this. And it was actually on the table at the uh, WHO R&D Blueprint. Uh, there was a working group on well health. And I know that there's many people in our department that are interested in One Health applications in uh, family medicine, particularly around issues around climate change. So I'm going to close. This is a bit of a tease slide. That's not a picture of Sergei Korsakov. Uh, it's actually uh, this gentleman who we've all read his uh, quotation. So this is George Santayana. Uh, who in a four volume uh, history of human reason uh, has one sentence that has been uh, well remembered and uh, oft repeated that those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I ask, you know, how long until we forget again? And what do we need to do to not have another report? Uh, I was uh, taking a poll in the, one of the classes I was teaching uh, in the planetary health course. So when will be the date of forgetting. It's within five years, within 10 years, and when will we get a new alarm clock to allow us to be better prepared for the next pandemic, which will inevitably come and uh, could be potentially worse than the one that we've just experienced. And so I'll come back to uh, ask you what your diagnosis of the world is and uh, what you think the uh, treatment is and what the prognosis is. And with that, I will thank you for your time. And I thank the department for the opportunity and privilege of being able to speak. Uh, there are so many other voices that I think could enlighten this pandemic experience uh, better than I have, uh, but thank you for the opportunity and I will stop. Great, thanks so much Ross for that um, very stimulating talk as usual. Um, I see no questions in the Q&A, so um, there's a good chance if you had any questions arising from Ross's talk, please enter them in the Q&A. Just a reminder that it's a, a button at the bottom of your screen next to the raise hand button, it's where it says Q&A, so you can type in your question there. And if you like a question from one of um, our colleagues, then you can upvote it so that uh, we can see that that will be a priority question that I will ask. Um, but given that there are no questions at the moment, I think people are still trying to digest um, the excellent talk. Um, I'm going to, um, actually, I do see Helen Batty asking a question. Is this all inevitable evolution of Gaia? So maybe I'll lob that your way, Ross. Thanks, Helen. Um, you know, I like the, 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 I, the word inevitable. Uh, so at many tables, uh, that I've sat at, uh, people keep talking about something being inevitable. So for example, uh, vaccine passports or certificates, it's inevitable, it's going to happen. Uh, I, I would like to challenge whether uh, what's happening now uh, in terms of our ecosystem health is necessarily inevitable. Um, I think if you look at, for example, the climate change literature, uh, we know we have a small window of opportunity, uh, but there is still some you know, the, uh, suggestion that we can start to uh, change things around. Uh, the other thing that I've been heartened by is this attention to people understanding better epidemiology. So even, the, even as critical as I've been about some of the discourse around curve flattening, it actually communicates to people that, that there, there's a problem 
uh, that we can shift those curves and we can shift those curves through collective action. So one of the uh, most important uh, dimensions here is to actually understand and live uh, through a form of solidarity, which is something that the Director General of the World Health Organization has said uh, not just once, but a uh, hundred times. This is in our hands. And, uh, you know, it's, I've often felt like I've been bailing the Titanic working in ethics because ethics is about what people do of their own volition without uh, legal sanction or sticks. But we do need to start thinking about better ways of organizing our behavior and working better together, appreciating common goods. My fear is that we're, you know, and I read the New York Times and I read, uh, you know, the, the news in jurisdictions where things are getting better, that we forget that the important message that we're not safe until everyone is safe and that we do have an obligation to actually assist uh, in uh, other parts of the world that haven't even started their vaccination or have uh, uh, health systems that uh, are uh, dysfunctional or non-existent. So I think the inevitability is something that we construct and that we can deconstruct uh, through concerted effort. Thanks, Ross. We have another question here about um, the One Health model. Is this a utilitarian approach? No, it's actually uh, quite a, uh, I would say it's the contrary. So if you think of the history of utilitarianism, it's a form of what we call consequentialist thinking, maximizing, aggregating of benefits. Um, so we know of utilitarianism mostly through when we ever do a cost benefit or a cost effectiveness analysis. Uh, so the roots of uh, One Health are in uh, sort of environmental philosophy uh, and uh, uh, environmental ecology, uh, which is not necessarily utilitarian in nature because it's not trying to maximize the well-being of any one particular the quanta of any uh, one experience of any one species. It does actually start to uh, uh, focus on many of the things that are within a pandemic, our interrelatedness. Uh, so it's really hard to uh, maximize or to figure out the entity that you're trying to maximize in a consequentialist or utilitarian way of thinking. And human utilitarianism is the greatest good for the greatest number. And goodness is actually uh, related to uh, quanta of happiness or pleasure. So the foundations of utilitarianism uh, relate into the uh, you know maximization of pleasure, minimize minimization of pain and uh, most ecological philosophers don't think within that uh, framework. I'm not sure if that's a clear answer, but it's not utilitarian, that's for sure. Okay, another question, I'm, I'm not sure you have the answer to this, but what insights do you have or can infer about disability after recovery of disease and how that contributes to further marginalized people? Well, so I think this is something that we all as clinicians know. Uh, maybe I, I don't know if this is speaking to long COVID uh, or the various forms. So we know that, uh, uh, you know, illness, you can recover, but sometimes, uh, you know, there's long-term sequelae, which require ongoing support. I think we need to be open uh, to that and uh, construct care systems that actually acknowledge and recognize the impact of COVID in the lives of people who have uh, experienced COVID-19 disease. And, you know, who better to do that than family physicians who actually have probably the most comprehensive understanding of what it means to be afflicted by illness across the life course. So uh, I think it's up to us to be the leaders there and the advocates for people who become ill and suffer disability as a consequence of COVID-19. Okay, thanks, Ross. A, a great question here from uh, Peter Newman. Um, regarding your app comment, how long until we forget again? Do you have some specific suggestions for ongoing advocacy? So uh, I've actually told uh, the fifth sector that it's journalists, somebody's got to keep us awake somehow. Uh, uh, I think the independent panel report is filled with some good suggestions about increased surveillance and vigilance, uh, but uh, it's a little light on, on how health systems can actually uh, contribute to that. So I think we need to teach this. I think we need to run simulations. Uh, I mean, when I entered into medical school, nobody told me anything about the possibility of me potentially becoming infected uh, when I 
gave care to people. In the 80s, attention to infection prevention and control uh, was virtually non-existent. And the idea that there might be something of a pandemic where everybody got sick simultaneously uh, wasn't there was nowhere to be seen on the curriculum. After SARS-1, I started to advocate, you know, because I heard people say when I was doing work with the, uh, 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 you know, obligations of health professionals, people say, I, I, I didn't sign up for this. And after I started to look into the history, I thought, how can we not know? How can we admit people to medical school, nursing, allied health, not knowing about this? It's actually constitutive to our work. Uh, so I think we need to do a much better job of teaching and preparation, uh, really enhancing our, our understanding of infection prevention and control. Uh, and to that end, uh, just a small uh, personal disclosure, I was actually the first uh, uh, postgraduate trainee at U of T to be parentally, parentally exposed to HIV. It wasn't even called HIV, it was HDLV3, uh, because I was taught to do blood gases. And you remember those tiny little corks, and you'd, you'd put them in. And it was my first night on call as, a, as, as an intern, and I was on the cardiac arrest team. And I had just gone up to at uh, Toronto Western, they had a large respiratory floor filled with people with pneumocystis. Nobody taught me anything about HIV in medical school. Here I am on my first week as an intern. And just as I go to cap that needle in that little piece of cork, the cardiac arrest beeper goes off and I drive that needle through the cork and right into my thumb. Uh, and because why? Because we had systems that didn't protect us. And if there's anything that we've learned from SARS-1 through this is we need systems of, you know, we need healthcare professionals to know the risks that they might face and we need to invest. I mean, you know, I showed there's no difference between the plague doctor and the modern uh, PPE other than plastics. We need to invest in research and finding ways to get people protected. And actually many people across the world in working in health uh, clinics don't even have access to soap and water. So we've got a, a huge agenda of, uh, ahead of us for health professionals. Yeah. And so when are we going to forget? Probably within five years, I would imagine. Okay, on that sobering note, it's it's 9.15 now. Um, Viola, do you want me to continue asking questions or do we need to go to the break now or should, should I ask a few more? There are a few more questions available. If Ross has the time to take a few more, we could sh shorten the break a little bit. Okay. We, we had uh, scheduled a 15 minute break. So I think if Ross can answer one or two more, that would be fine. Okay. So yeah, I'm happy question. to. Okay, great. Um, question from Chris Meany. Can you comment on Canada's, Ontario's uh, attempt to mitigate pandemic effects through a series of complex multi-week slash month lockdown mechanisms? Are the lockdowns ethical? Should we have experimented with different NPIs, so that's non-pharmaceutical interventions, to control a pandemic? Uh, Chris, that's a, a, a fabulous question and one that I don't think I have a, a, a good answer to at this moment. I can have opinions on it. Um, so just like I've spent the last uh, 18 years working on SARS-1, I think many of us will spend the remainder of our careers uh, looking at these exact questions. So there is actually some interesting reports coming out that are looking, that are looking at comparative health system responses uh, to SARS-CoV-2. Uh, one of the things that's been really fascinating is, is we actually can't, we've got crude estimates of the effects of, of the effect size of certain NPIs, but uh, we can't actually separate out the strands. They're, they're all uh, very well confounded. So you're actually in a position of uh, maximizing NPI. Was it ethical to, to do these things? I would argue yes. In fact, uh, a lot of the work that I did uh, before SARS and subsequent to SARS was looking at what are the ethical justifications for the use of uh, NPIs, uh, isolation, quarantine. Oftentimes it's the only thing that you have, particularly in the emergence of a new pathogen for which there are no medical countermeasures. So we know, I mean, there is no mysterious new mechanism by which uh, infections go from person to person, right? We, those 
pathways are all well established. And breaking the chains of transmission is the best way to stop and we need to do. So public health authorities have the obligation and every nation state on earth has public health laws that give over to public health authorities uh, the powers to take steps to protect community from preventable spread. Now, we're gonna go back and look at that and we can ask questions about proportionality, about whether it was the least restrictive, about whether reciprocity conditions were met. Uh, but in the absence of clear evidence of what works, public health has to take the steps necessary to actually prevent spread in the community. And I think we'll see, I always joke that after SARS, the, you know, when Canada has something bad happen, we have commissions of inquiry. And if something really bad happens, we have a royal commission. And the commissions of inquiry after SARS-1 actually exceed the shelf space of the collective works of Proust. Uh, there's a large amount of uh, recommendations there that were never acted upon. Uh, actually, just two weeks before uh, the SARS pandemic came up, I uh, met with a colleague saying, you know, we're coming up to the 20th anniversary of SARS-1. Why don't we have a symposium where we go back and look at all those commissions of inquiry, look at the recommendations, see which ones have been acted on and which ones haven't. And then, of course, we're going to have a whole set of new uh, uh, inquiries that are going to say pretty much, I think, a lot of what has already been said. So the question is, how do we actually get it through our thick skulls and act upon them this time? Sorry, that was a bit opinionated. Yeah, no, thanks, Ross. Okay, last question from Michael Roberts. Thank you, Ross, for such a profound and timely lecture. What a remarkable demonstration of how the integration of history, health, humanities, understanding of the social determinants of health, epidemiology, planetary health, and ethics assists us in making sense of these COVID times. I am curious how you would suggest we individually and collectively address the theme of moral injury. So uh, that's a great question. Michael, uh, and there's actually a nice framework uh, about moral injury, and it actually, you know, uh, you know, if we could bring Cat back into this, there's a, there's a lot of, a lot of the resonance in moral injury are actually some of the things that are called for in uh, calls to reconciliation. You, you you have to acknowledge where the injury comes. You have to hear the voices, uh, as painful as it may be, of people who have been harmed, and your either complicit or explicit role that you've played in that harm. So Michael, I will send you a really nice paper that talks about responding to moral injury through moral repair. I think it's something that we need to think about. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Ross, um, you, you, for your great talk and, um, and your great answers to these questions. So I think it's time for break now. Oh, I, I just wanted oh. to thank a few a few uh, messages before break so thank you ross for uh everything from athens to zika and a philosophy lesson in there i'd encourage you to look at the chat ava's posted something about a new metric um alongside of kt interval talking about time to lessons forgotten uh, so i thought that was very interesting uh, i want to thank you ross i want to thank you jeff for moderating so effectively and i want to thank all of the participants for engagement and very profound questions we are going to take a, a break right now but um, i wanted to remind everyone that this session has been recorded and will be posted on the dfc conference website and uh, I'd like everyone to uh, if you could please kindly return by 9 30 we will be starting promptly uh, with the second plenary so thank you Ross thank you Jeff okay I would like to uh, introduce Dr. Karen Tu and congratulate her on being the recipient of the Earl Dunn award Dr. Karen Tu is a professor in the DFCM with a cross appointment at the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. She is also a research scientist at North York General Hospital and a family physician in the Toronto Western Hospital Family Health Team. Karen is a pioneer in the use of primary care EMR data in research and is the Associate Director of Utopian. U of T's practice-based research overseeing the Utopian EMR database. Today, Karen is going to give us a global view of the pandemic using EMR data from Intrepid, a consortium of primary care 
big data researchers that the pandemic inspired her to start. I also want to welcome Dr. Michelle Griever, the Gordon F. Cheeseboro Research Chair in Family and Community Medicine at North York General Hospital and the Director of Utopian. Dr. Griever will be moderating. I want to welcome everyone back to the second plenary session. Welcome, Karen and Michelle. Thank you, Viola. Um, it, it's a great pleasure and honor to be giving the Earl Dunn Lecture. I know everybody's worlds have been turned upside down. It's great to see, to see, see at least virtually, um, so many people taking the time out to um, gather here today and listen to Ross and I, I speak. Uh, sec. <laughs> um, okay, I uh, the. Disclosures I have is that I received salary support from the DFCM Research Scholar Program, also through North York General Hospital and through Toronto Western Hospital Family Health Team. Um, this program has received financial support from North York General Hospital Exploration Fund for seed funding to initiate the establishment of Intrepid, a CIHR operating grant for COVID-19 mental health and substance use service needs and delivery, through the Rathlin Foundation Primary Care EMR Research and Discovery Fund uh, for in infrastructure support uh, for Utopian. And um, as of yesterday, a CIHR postdoctoral fellow in, in the name of Ellen Stevenson. Um, so I'm going to talk about the impact of the pandemic on primary care, the DFCM response, what's happening at home and the international picture. So why study the impact of the pandemic on primary care? I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, um, but he, indulge me for a few minutes to read some headlines. COVID-19, staggering number of extra deaths in the community is not explained by COVID-19. Indirect acute effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on physical and mental health in the UK, a population-based study. Non-COVID excess deaths by age and gender in the United States during the first three months of the COVID-19 pandemic. We all know that COVID did not just impact the people that got it, it's impacted the whole society and has had great impact on the delivery of primary care. Um, so I am the Associate Director of Utopian, which is the EMR database arm of Utopian. Um, it's Utopian is led by uh, Dr. Michelle Griever, and um, there's two associate directors, myself uh, on the EMR arm and um, Andrew Pinto on the clinical trials arm. And Utopian is um, part of SIPSIN, in case you're not aware. Um, SIPSIN is the Canadian Primary Care Sentinel Surveillance Network. There's um, 11 different practice-based research networks across the country. Utopian is the largest of those 11 networks, contributing about a third of the patients to that network. And Utopian has recently um, been morphed into Poplar. Poplar is a new um, organization or um, database that is going to combine all of the practice-based research networks in Ontario into one. Um, it includes OPEN at the University of Ottawa, EON at Queens, um, North from NASM, Music from McMaster, and Delphi from Western. Um, and it also is going to include uh, Alliance data from the community health centers across Ontario. I'm the scientific lead, and this is the brainchild of O'Neill Bhattacharya and Michelle Griever. And just last week, we were um, very delighted to receive um, funding support from the Ministry of Health for the next year by way of a million dollars. Um, so several years ago, when Dr. Michael Kidd was our um, chair, he had the idea that we should be doing um, a family medicine report. I, I don't know if you, you are aware, but research in family medicine has always been the poor cousin. There hasn't been a lot of donor support for 
for family medicine, people like to support cardiology, um, neurologic diseases, mental health, but very little funding support comes to primary care. So Michael thought it would be a great idea to do this report to try to educate people on um, family medicine and raise the profile of family medicine, try to generate um, funding support for family medicine research. So he came up with this report and the first report um, came out in our 50th year. And it was just a very broad sweeping overview of family medicine. And then last year's report, we focused in a bit on our, um, our diverse populations, looking at people that potentially were marginalized and the vulnerable people. And then we had a meeting um, earlier this year to talk about what the third report might look like and whether we should actually even do it. And um, there was discussion like people are tapped out, everybody's so busy, do we have the energy to do it? And, and I busy working on trying to get Poplar together, thought oh, I wouldn't have time, but the, I thought about it and I thought, I thought there's no way we can't do it. We have to do it. Family medicine has really risen to the occasion um, with COVID and we really need to highlight that and champion it. We've risen to the challenge. We've been carrying through the crisis, and I, f I feel like family medicine has been elevated, um, at least in Canada, um, for showing just great ability to pivot and adapt and change. So we we put out a call, and we we got um, tremendous response. Even though everybody's really busy, people were very happy to participate and contribute stories. You're going to hear stories about um, COVID care at home from women's, the people at Women's College. Um, you're going to, of course, learn about virtual care, education using virtual care. We'll, there'll be stories about swabbing in the early days of the pandemic. Um, one, I remember swabbing in long-term care homes and even swabbing in a maximum security prison on a, in the parking lot on a TTC bus. Um, and of course, vaccination. We family medicine has played a huge role in the role in the role that of vaccination. Uh, first, in the long, um, we've been mobile. This is um, Dr. Villani at um, uh, Saint Mike's, I believe, who is um, who was vaccinating on Toronto, on the Toronto Island um, for uh, the elderly people that were home based. Um, colleagues at North York General have um, led the vaccinator, this mobile bus. Um, Dr. Rebecca Stoller and Dr. Maria Maraca, they've thought outside the box to try to encourage people to get um, vaccinations. They, they um, enlisted Harvey's to come with their mobile uh, truck and give burgers to people that wanted vaccinations. They've recently um, targeted these vaccinations in the Filipino community and in the Latino community. And, and then not to be outdone, we, we've done given away free ice cream for vaccines um, at Nathan Phillips Square and um, in the Rotunda and City Hall. That was quite a surreal day. I, I remember pulling up to do my shift here and I, I was driving along Queen Street to, into the parking lot and I was behind this car that had very um, professionally painted on it, pandemic hoax, no masks, no vaccines. And um, sure enough, the anti-maskers um, and anti-vaccinators were there. They were, um, the police was, was very good about keeping them barricaded from the people trying to get vaccines, but it was, it was somewhat unpleasant. They were yelling at the kids that they shouldn't listen to their parents. They yelled at healthcare workers that you're, you're performing genocide. Um, one of my colleagues, or, uh, one of my colleague's daughter got vaccinated there and she was yelled at to tell her she was gonna be infertile and that she'd never have children. It, it was a strange, it was a strange day. And of course um, our colleagues, that have led the vaccination for the black community, Dr. Uh, Agabit and Dr. Norm and Dr. David Esho, 
They um, developed these pop-up clinics for the Black community in, um, at the Jamaican Community Center in Scarborough, and also have led a bunch of clinics in um, Peel. Um, I remember watching a interview that Dr. Esho did, and um, one of the people getting vaccinated said she had never seen so many Black physicians um, in one place, and she was so um, inspired and, and motivated to these um, to these ins inspirational leaders in, in healthcare. And of course, if you haven't seen it, you have to check it out. Um, our own Dr. Jeff Kwong is um, an integral part of the ISIS, ICES COVID-19 dashboard. Um, it gives very up-to-date information on COVID um, positivity rates. The information coming out of ICES is uh, shaping the policy for um, COVID and the vaccination rollout. This is just showing you, uh, I think this is updated weekly, showing you the rates of COVID vaccination by um, neighborhood so you, you can see what's going on. This is really tremendous um, policy altering uh, work that um, family medicine, a family physician researcher is heavily involved in. And so I'm now going to just show you a look at some current um, studies being conducted in Utopian. Um, so the Utopian Data Safe Haven team is made up of several family physician researchers, database managers, biostatisticians, postdoctoral fellow, and other scientists. Um, this paper is coming out in a week or two in CMAJ Open, looking at the changes in family medicine visits after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in Ontario. Um, there were 22% fewer visits and 35% fewer individuals accessing care from family physicians between um, March 14th and June 30th compared to 2019, in 2020 compared to 2019. Um, we looked at um, differences in age and sex in terms of accessing care, um, coming to the family doctor for visits, and we noted that um, males and people under 18 years of age were, um, had larger de decreases in visits to their family doctor. We looked at um, potential differences by socioeconomic status. We looked at income quintiles, material deprivation quintile, and ethnic concentration quintile. And we did not see any differences in uh, visits uh, by socioeconomic status. That's not to say it reduced any barriers that may have been pre-existing, but it did not increase barriers um, um, compared to previous. And this paper has been submitted and is awaiting review, looking at the changes in the top 25 reasons for primary care visits during the pandemic. Um, so these are the top 25 reasons for visit to primary care in 2019. The light green is the 2019 um, visits and the uh, darker green is the 2020 visits. As you can see, anxiety was the number one reason in 2019 and became even more so in 2020, and um, periodic health exams have dramatically decreased. Um, so there was 1.3 times more visits for anxiety. There was fewer visits for chronic conditions such as diabetes and hypertension. Um, there was almost 10 times fewer he periodic health exams and left less than half as many um, people coming in for the common cold. So we looked a little bit, um, we are looking a little bit more deeply at the um, COVID-19 pandemic effects on anxiety and depression. Um, so there was um, increased visits per visitor and there's increase in the number of patients visiting for anxiety and depression multiple times per week. The, the increase was quite dramatic at the beginning. And as we, we go through 2020, it, it starts to decline. Um, there was an increased visitor rate. So there's more patients visiting for anxiety, depression, at least once per month um, as the pandemic 
was onset. And we looked at this by age category and by sex. And we note that this is primarily happening in the um, female patients. And um, a little bit of an alarming finding we're we, we found is that in the young age group, in the age 10 to 24, um, initially there was a drop, but um, then later on in the year, the, um, the rates for coming in for anxiety, depression were, were markedly increased. For males, it was, you can see the, it was pretty flat um, and not much change except for maybe the oldest age category for males. And this is just showing you the expected trend based on 2018-2019 um, data. So the um, orange um, color is the all visitors. So um, based on what would be predicted in um, according to rates of visits in 20, uh, 17, 2018 to 2019. And the green is for the first time visit in the past 12 months, in, in the past year. And the black line is what actually happened. And as you can see, the um, for females, it um, is quite a bit consistently above expected. For males, it, it's pretty a pretty consistent pattern to what was would have been expected. Um, and this is looking at um, the first antidepressant prescription in the past year. And we didn't really find, um, we found although there was an initial drop in antidepressant prescribing um, from what would have been expected that um, towards the end of the year, it came in line with the rates that would have been predicted um, according to 2018-2019 rates. And we're starting to look at the impact of COVID-19 on diabetes screening and management. And this is just looking at rates of screening for diabetes in patients age 40 plus. Um, and as you can see, there's a big drop in screening, um, but there is um, a recovery as we go towards the end of the year. And this is looking at rates of visits um, for patients with diabetes. Um, and we know that there is a drop in the rates of visits from com compared to 2019 in 2020 compared to 2019. The blue, uh, the lighter blue is virtual visits and the dark blue is in-person visits. And about 77% of these visits um, for diabetes are virtual um, during the pandemic time. Um, and of course, uh, it's probably is no surprise that rates for monitoring um, for diabetes have gone down although they are recovering not to the um, levels of 2019. And then it comes as no surprise that uh, rates of blood pressures being measured, weights being taken um, for the people with diabetes has gone down and has not shown much of a recovery. My colleague Catherine G is leading um, work on looking at the pandemic impacts impacts on infant immunizations. Um, she hypothesized that potentially the pandemic may have resulted in less um, infants getting their vaccinations because of um, less visits to the physician and more virtual care. Um, but we were um, heartened to find that that's not really been the case for the younger infants for so at two months, four months and six months um, rates of childhood immunization are pretty good, um, are, are consistent with levels previously. As we get into the older age groups, uh, the 15 months, 18 months, um, the vaccinations are um, dropped uh, quite a bit at the start of the pandemic, um, but seem to be recovering. And by 24 months, there seems to be reasonable catch up, not quite to the level of previous, but um, it looks like there is going to be reasonable catch up for these vaccinations. 
So the Weiss study, um, the pandemic impacts in primary care at an international level. Um, I've, as I was doing a lit search on this for one of the papers coming out, um, I came across this paper that was written in 2012, and it was titled "The Primary Care, Primary Care Research and International Responsibility." And um, um, one of the reasons they cited for doing international um, primary care research is is that they predicted emerging infectious diseases with potential widespread health and economic impacts would be one of the reasons why we should, um, why primary care research should be an international responsibility. So out comes the INTREPID, which stands for the International Consortium of Primary Care Big Data Researchers. And I developed this last, that last year, um, Back in November of 2019, I was invited to the University of Melbourne uh, because they were developing an, they had developed an EMR database and they wanted to learn about um, secondary use of EMR data in, in the Canadian experience. And so they had also, at the time I went there, they had also invited um, researchers from the University, the National University of Singapore and um, after that, that visit, we thought we wanted to do an international comparative study, and we were going to look at, we landed on chronic kidney disease, and to look at um, quality of care and chronic kidney disease in our three respective countries. And then um, as we started to have meetings um, in early 2020, um, a Swedish fellow was visiting the University of Melbourne and he said he had database um, access in Sweden and he joined on. So we were gonna do this four country study um, on comparing CKD management. And then, then the pandemic um, started and um, at University of Toronto, all non-COVID related research was stopped. And um, this, it was a similar situation in other countries. If you weren't doing COVID-related research, um, you weren't allowed to, to do it. Um, REBs, there'd be long delays. They didn't even want to look at uh, studies unless they were um, COVID-related. So, um, so we kind of stopped um, for a bit and um, um, kind of deferred doing the study until after the pandemic, which we didn't know how long was gonna last. Um, but then in June, CIHR put out a call for, um, for COVID related research. And um, it was the first call in a long time and every other, other standard calls for um, operating grants uh, were halted. And so everybody, um, everybody that did research all applied to this this one pen. I think there was several thousand applications, and the um, the competition was quite stiff. Anyways, I, I thought of putting in this grant, and I, I thought to study the um, impact on primary care uh, uh, of the COVID nineteen pandemic, and I thought, oh, I could bring in my international colleagues in Australia, in Singapore, in Sweden to come in and be, be part of the grant. And they said, sure, they would be happy to be part of it. And um, they provided me with letters of support. And then the colleague in Sweden was, said he would participate, but he um, didn't get, get me his letter of support and time was ticking down. The grant was due on a Tuesday. It was Saturday morning and I had a meeting with um, the local team and I said, okay, I've got Australia and I have Singapore, but the Swedish guy isn't responding. Do you think I should try and ask to see if other countries um, would be interested in participating? Um, and they, they said, I said, is it too embarrassing to ask at this late, late date? Cause it's Saturday and it's due on, on Tuesday. And they said, you know, the worst thing that can happen is they say no, and you still have Australia and Singapore. That's great. Um, so I, I said, okay. So the meeting ended around noon and I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll just 
put out an email to um, Dr. Simon DeLusignan, who's a researcher in the UK, who had a relationship um, with Utopian and who I'd met many years ago that, and I knew did um, primary care EMR research. And I sent him an email and I said, I know it's a, it's a, a very late ask, but I'm wondering if you would be willing to participate in the study. And within an hour, he responded um, with a resounding yes, and I will get you the letter of support um, by the end of the weekend. And he said, I can contribute 5 million patients. And I thought, that's great. And so after getting that response in an hour, I thought, well, what would it hurt if I just tried to reach out to some other people that I knew that may be interested? Um, so I said, it, it doesn't hurt the worst that can happen is they say no, or they don't look at the email. So I, I dug back in my emails, maybe five years, five or six years. I emailed someone I knew in Norway that had reached out to me previously, someone I had um, met in South Korea and in China. Um, and you know, by the end of the weekend, they were all on board. So I was sitting on Monday, um, 24 hours to do, do the grant. We had eight countries. We had Australia and Singapore and South Korea and Sweden and Norway and uh, the UK and China. But um, I thought, and at that time, things were going crazy in the US. And I said, this would be really strange if we didn't have the US in because there was so much COVID going on. We're doing this primary care research, all these other countries, but no US. Who, who, how could I get someone from the US? And so at six o'clock in the evening on Monday, I thought, okay, I met this guy at Nab Craig several years ago. We've kind of had brief conversations. Oh, what the heck I will, I, I title it a Hail Mary pass. <laughs> um, would you be willing to, to do this and describe the study? And lo and behold, by eight o'clock that night, Monday night, I had my letter of support from the US with, um, with a contribution of 3 million patients. So we, I applied for the grant and um, we didn't get it. It, um, it, we didn't fare very well. It was very a tough competition, but then subsequently there was um, a competition to um, do a mental health, um, a look at mental health. So I, I used the, the same concept, but I, I rewrote the grant to focus on mental health. And so this is all the, um, the uh, international colleagues. Um, and it's really nice. We, we've had some colleagues that are senior that have brought in junior colleagues to participate in this, in this study. We've had um, colleagues that are junior that went and got um, more experienced colleagues to come and help mentor them through this collaboration. Um, we've been meeting every two to three weeks. I'm, I was, I'm really surprised at how much engagement there is. Everybody's really keen to uh, participate. We've had maybe 12 meetings so far. It's almost always um, very well attended. The sweet spot is eight o'clock in the morning for us, which is six o'clock in the morning in Colorado for my colleague in the United States and midnight in Australia. Um, but never fails, people show up and it, it's so nice to see um, such engagement um, and willingness to collaborate um, and look at the pandemic impacts in primary care in our respective countries and compared to each other. Um, so we have um, patient records of 35 million patients worldwide with either EMR data or administrative data in the respective countries. Um, this is the institutions that are participating in Intrepid. And as we all know, the rates of COVID are different in different countries and the rates of death of COVID are different in different countries. And this is just showing you some of the Intrepid countries um, and the rates of COVID versus vaccination. And it's interesting um, how things shift, have shifted through our, our um, 
meetings every two to three weeks. We were meeting in January and we were um, showing concern for our colleagues in the US and the UK who had skyrocketing um, rates of COVID. And, um, and we were sitting kind of not too bad in, in January. We had a second wave, but it was certainly not out of control. And then the UK and the US um, really got their vaccinations out quickly and they were able to bring their, um, their case rates down substantially. And then um, we had very slow rollout initially and our, our um, third wave was um, kind of went out of control. Um, but every three weeks we, when we're meeting, uh, you know, the condolences go to, go to different countries. Um, so our first study is to look at changes in primary care visits as a result of the pandemic. Um, so this is just showing you the COVID rates um, by individual country. So there's the high COVID um, rate countries, um, the top line, the middle row is kind of the moderate rates of COVID and the lower line is the countries with um, very little COVID compared to per million population. And um, different countries also have different um, containment measures that they've implemented. Um, so the containment and in health index is um, based on 13 response indications, including school closures, workplace closures, travel bans, testing policy, contact tracing, face coverings, and vaccine policy. And it is fluctuated um, throughout the pandemic. Um, the only notable thing is that Norway has scored relatively low on this health containment index. And this is just showing you um, by individual country. And so we wondered if um, rates of um, visits to primary care would be reflective in the rates of COVID or reflected in the um, types of uh, this degree of containment that countries have done. And we found that um, rates of in-person visit and virtual visits really have not reflected the um, rates of the containment indices or COVID cases. So the orange line is the rates of COVID, the um, blue line is the containment indices, and this graph is showing you the rates of primary care visit, the green being the virtual visits, the blue but are the in-person, and this is by um, a decrease in in-person visits. So Sweden had the lowest decrease in in-person visits and Canada had the highest decrease in in-person visits. And this is um, representing over 81 million patients um, visits to primary care physicians worldwide. And this is just a, a graph, a figure showing change in virtual visit volume by change in in-person visit volume. And we are an outlier. We have the largest decrease in face-to-face -face visits and the largest increase in virtual visits. And this is just showing you similar data. This is um, the year over year change in visit volume from 2019 to 2020. Um, so this is the blue is the in-person, the green is the virtual, and this is the total visit volume over here in the gray. So when you look at changes in total visit volume, when you look at Canada, the, the total visit volume is quite similar. You look at Sweden, the total visit volume is quite similar, but Canada, as you can see, has um, big drop in in-person and big increase in virtual, where Sweden has just a little drop in in-person and a little increase in virtual. And this, again, is just showing you um, the uh, uptake of virtual care by country and we are the number one uptakers of virtual care. So the next study we're going to look at is um, reasons for visit. And so I showed you this previously 
where anxiety um, is the number one reason for visit. And the second, um, second and third are diabetes and hypertension. Um, the orange line is the common cold and the green lines are the periodic health exams. And then we just have Singapore data so far. And um, this is what it's showing. Um, so their number one reason for visit was acute respiratory infections, but that has dropped dramatically since the onset of the pandemic. And I asked my colleague in Singapore why that would be. And he told me that um, people in Singapore didn't come to the doctor and for colds or respiratory infections because they were afraid of a mandatory quarantine. So if they came to the um, office um, with any kind of URTI symptoms, they would automatically government mandated quarantine and they'd have to miss work whether they had COVID or not. So that resulted in people being afraid to come for that reason. And then I also asked them why anxiety was like, it wasn't even on the radar for, for them. And he also told me that um, people tend not to code for anxiety or depression or mental health conditions because for fear that their employer would find out that they had a mental health condition and that could have negative consequences for them at work. So they said they try to avoid um, billing for that condition um, or anything suggestive of that condition in, in their health records and they'll just bill for some physical, some other physical ailment. So future directions for this, um, we really want to look at the impact of virtual care on quality. Um, we want to look at um, vaccine hesitancy and effectiveness. It was really interesting. Um, one of my meetings was on, with a colleague in Sweden was on a day when that morning he had um, already planned to give AstraZeneca um, to to about 300 patients. He had them all lined up, booked into the clinic. He had the vaccine ready to go. And he got a call from public health to say, no, you cannot give that vaccine. We are putting a pause on distributing that vaccine. And he was, he was heartbroken because there was no other vaccines available. He thought it was a good vaccine. He said he would have taken it himself, um, but the public health said, no, you cannot um, distribute it. Our colleagues in Norway um, found uh, they were probably one of the first that reported this clotting um, with, with, um, with uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. They reported rates of one in 30,000, which they found was unacceptable. Um, later on in the pandemic, uh, or a few weeks ago, talking to my colleague in the UK and he was, they were opening up and they had good vaccination rates and their concern was um, what they were gonna do with um, flu shots and interaction of the COVID vaccine with flu shots. And that was at a time where we just, we had a great shortage of vaccination. We couldn't get our hold on our hold on vaccines in Canada. It was very frustrating for us. And, and um, our colleagues in Australia talk about um, tons of vaccine hesitancy because the risk of getting a side effect from the vaccine was higher than the risk of getting COVID because they've done such a great job in containing COVID in Australia. So time will tell um, how this all pans out and whether these um, countries will eventually uptake um, vaccination or not. It's also interesting in Hong Kong, they um, bought uh, four vaccines for every citizen. They could go to uh, the vaccination center and they would get to choose from four different vaccines. Um, but apparently the uptake is really low. People in, in Hong Kong don't wanna get the vaccination. Um, I think it's maybe nine, nine, nine or 19% of people in Hong Kong have been vaccinated, um, yet there's ample supply of vaccine. Um, so my colleague, uh, Dr. Angela Chung, um, looked at prevalence of long-term effects in individuals diagnosed with COVID-19. 
So another really interesting um, area of study is long COVID that we've discussed with the Intrepid group that we want to look at. So in terms, she, she's done this kind of live systematic review um, and they're looking at short-term impacts versus long-term impacts of, of COVID on, in symptomatology. And 83% of people had one or more symptoms four to 12 weeks um, post COVID diagnosis and more than 50% of patients had symptoms uh, greater than 12 weeks in terms of long-term COVID. So the number one um, symptom people had was fatigue. There was high general pain or discomfort, sleep disturbances, anxiety, depression, shortness of breath, hair loss were all in the 22 to 23%. There's also cognitive impairment, um, muscle pain and joint pain that could be persistent palpitations and not return to work um, was about is about nine percent in patients um, with COVID with long COVID. So as you can see, um, some of the symptoms that we want to look at, this isn't going to be available in other databases. So this is a bit of an avid advertisement and encouragement for people to contribute their EMR data so that we can do these these studies on long COVID. The, uh, things like fatigue and general pain and discomforts and sleep disturbances, we're not gonna be able to get that from administrative data. That kind of stuff is buried in the free text of family physician records. So we really hope to be able to mine that data and um, we encourage you all to contribute your data to Utopian and um, primary care EMR research so we can study this this um, area of research, and we can also um, compare to our colleagues um, around the world. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Karen, for the really great presentation and uh, notes about them. Um, I'm just going to read one uh, the notes. Uh, Karen, you're an example of exceptional leadership. Congratulations. You're a great example for all of us. Um, please put your questions in the Q&A. Uh, I'm going to start asking uh, some of them. So from Trish Wenquim, uh, Karen, is your data from billing codes? Um, some of it's from billing codes. Um, and some of it is like the blood pressures and the heights and weights. Um, those are not. We have the cumulative patient profile. Um, so we can see things documented in there. And we are avidly working on trying to get the free text data so that we can have um, all that rich free text data. We have it from two of our vendors that contribute to Utopian, and we're just looking to add the third. Okay. Um, from Eva Grenfeld, um, how do you interpret the differential uptake of virtual visits? Uh, could it be related to differential access to necessary IT in the population? <sighs> I think it is, um, I think it's a cultural thing. I, I like, I've tried to, I don't think there's one kind of thing. So in some countries, the virtual uptake was poor because it wasn't remunerated. Um, but in other countries, it, it was remunerated at the same level as a regular visit. So Australia is another big virtual uptake um, country. And like they, they have very good COVID, rate, COVID rates. So it's not, necessary that they necessarily need to do the virtual, um, but their remuneration for virtual care is the same as an in-person and urging this virtual care. Um, so yeah, I really, there's not one factor. And I, I think a lot of it is this cultural, cultural. Yeah, it's quite possible. Just a reminder for everyone, if you really want to see a question answered, please. Uh, uploaded. Um, so I'm going to ask the next question from uh, Romero Wellington. Um, this was an excellent presentation. Can you comment on rates of cancer screening and changes? Yeah, that's that's an area we really want to look at. That's kind of next on the list to, um, to look at. And I really think that cancer, I will not be surprised to see cancer rates going down. I will not be surprised to see um, that people are coming, that cancers are being missed and that people are, will be presenting with late stage cancer. 
um, we put in a grant to try to study this, um, CHR and also to CoRIG. So we'll find out in the coming months if we're gonna get funding for that. Um, but either way, I think it's really important to study and we'll find a way to, to study it. Okay, uh, from John Rizas, uh, was there an examination of the reasons for decreased visits categorized by patient reason versus physician reason? No, we did not. I, I, I didn't, I don't know how we could, I mean, we did categorize it as um, kind of acute care, um, periodic health exams and um, chronic disease management, but I, I couldn't think of a classification of generated by like patient reason versus physician reason. Okay. Now, so questions about uh, time interval between doses of vaccines, uh, whether children should get the vaccination, can these data help guide decisions on this? Yeah, we really want to look at like the, um, the UK folks really want to look at this because they've, they've delayed their vaccinations for three months um, for the second dose. I think other countries like the US has not really, um, the Norway and the UK have great um, databases for this. I hope that we're going to have these, that COVAX um, exists. Uh, so there is a decent database. It's a little bit hard to get accessible. I'm very heartened to see that it's being put into primary care family doctors, um, EMRs. So hopefully it's a smooth rollout over the next month or so. Our next data collection will be in July, and then we can start doing these comparative studies. Okay, uh, from Nicholas Chorok. Uh, thank you for joining us, Nicholas. Um, an underlying theme from the international and national et cetera, uh, collaborations, underlying theme appears to be uh, high quality data infrastructure and available EMR system. Uh, what are your thoughts on this topic regarding potential inequities that this may cause in countries that currently do not have technology or primary care infrastructure in place? So they don't have data, um, could they be left behind on a global scale? So th that's a good question. And, and it is quite variable on how readily available the EMRD is. So well, my colleagues, some of, some of the countries, it's like, okay, it's, um, yeah, we can have last week's data today. The UK, Australia are like, no problem. We can have the data, yeah, but delayed. I was like, I was getting data from other countries and I'm like, sorry, we don't have our data yet. It's about a three month lag and we, we collect data every six months. And then we have China and South Korea, which don't have these big databases and they, um, they do, so South Korea had this big uh, insurance data that we could potentially access. And so originally they were said they could contribute 50 million patients from their national insurance data. But then it turned out that um, it was very hard to access. They just didn't have the bandwidth to access. And they said, all we can do is contribute our our little clinics data. And I said, that's fine. And we can start from there. And, and um, China also had just one clinic and Singapore only has six clinics, but it's, it's fine. I think, I think it's, it's not as generalizable, but it, they can still participate and they're really actively interested in wanting to learn from us. And um, we can potentially build up their data sources. Um, in, in their countries as we go along. Yeah, I think what you're saying is you can't improve what you don't measure. So access to ethical access to an availability of data as uh, an equity measure might be important in the future. Um, from John Rizzos, um, was there a control group that researchers could compare incidents of long COVID sim sim symptoms between those with and without COVID? Um, not yet. So these, those, we have not started doing those studies. So definitely we, we want to, to do that. Um, that was just data from a systematic review. So we have to, you know, as, in, as the year goes on, as we collect more data, um, I know NIH has put, um, my colleagues in the U.S. have, they're part of a 90 million or some 
huge amount of money um, that the states is pouring into long COVID studies over the next five years. Um, so it's a really hot topic and, and I hope that we can participate as well. Yeah, thank you, Karen. Uh, so from Kevin Lai, thank you for joining us, Kevin. Um, do virtual visit data differentiate between telephone visits um, and video enable or online visits? So it depends on the country. Um, our data, there's another billing code if you do a specific thing. We weren't confident that we could really do that. So we just grouped ours into one um, category. Some of the other countries were able to, some weren't. So we decided just to group them into one, um, one, one type of visit, calling it virtual. I suspect that it's mostly phone um, and that uh, video is, is a lot less. Okay. Um, from O'Neill Bhattacharya, uh, can you comment on which countries did the best job of maintaining access to primary care in concert with containment measures? Um, so if access is equal um, in, um, if access is, if in-person is equivalent to virtual, then I would say probably Sweden <laughs> had great access. Um, but they didn't social distance either. Um, yeah, so they had the least drop in, um, uh, in well, in in-person visits. Okay. I think UK was pretty good as well. And if, if it's equivalent, um, then Australia, if virtual in in-person in is equivalent, then Australia, really was good at maintaining access. Okay, um, I think Viola, we have time for one more question or uh, there's two okay. Okay, so we'll start with one more. For Michael Roberts, um, it is troubling and understandable um, that there was an increase in primary care visits in young women uh, for anxiety. Uh, there's data on antidepressant usage. Is there any token data about how primary care approach anxiety in a non-pharmacological fashion? Yeah, we, we need to look at that. Um, uh, we, we really wanna delve into that young, young people visit. So we, we're using building codes for that. And so um, it doesn't necessarily mean there's anxiety as opposed to feeling anxious. We can't really differentiate that. Um, and then, so even though we saw these high rates of billing code use of anxiety and depression, we didn't really see um, antidepressants uh, prescribing increase. So we, we're actively looking deeper into this. Um, and I think it's um, and definitely an area of interest. So Utopian definitely welcomes questions. <laughs> and I think Karen, you're gonna be slowed under by questions. So please do contact us. Uh, one last question from Iris um, Trinos. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, with respect to virtual visits across jurisdictions, um, as I understand Canada was rel a relatively poor performer in terms of EMR and virtual visits before the pandemic. Are we surprised about the magnitude of increase in relative virtual visits. So I was surprised because I mean, I know we're doing a lot of virtual visits. I thought that was the norm. So I was surprised when I compared to the other countries that, and we know we're not a huge COVID, like this will happen all before we had our third way where things were, were quite bad. Um, so I was definitely surprised at um, how much uptake we had in virtual care. And so I think how that impacted on other stuff like quality of care is going to be really important to look at. So thank you very much, Karen, for a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you as well for, for, to everyone for the thoughtful uh, uh, questions. Um, and what I'll do is I'll pass it over to you, Viola.
<laughs> so once again, thank you, Karen, for the international insight into the impact of COVID, but also for sharing your very heartfelt story about getting the grant in the night before. I love to hear the personal side of things. It just brings things to life. So thank you for sharing that. I want to thank you, Michelle, for moderating so, so effectively. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't take a minute to actually thank uh, Dr. David White and Dr. David Tannenbaum um, for beyond this conference for leading our department so effectively during this challenging time of COVID and always, I think historically, even predating me, um, leading this department in times of um, turmoil and transition. So uh, a huge heartfelt thank you to both the Davids. I also want to thank uh, the planning committee. None of this is possible without uh, members of our planning committee. And I think Brian is going to uh, have a slide up. I won't call each person out in person, but it really does, uh, does take a, a team to think about this. And they have been so resilient over the past two years. Um, this conference was planned for last year and canceled. And then had to be abridged this year. So a huge thank you to the planning committee. Um, I also want to, uh, a special thanks goes out to Brian De Silva, Alicia Fung, Amy Noyes, Nicole Reyes, uh, and Carolyn Taranko uh, for coordinating and organizing this conference. None of what we do really in the department would be possible without the administrative support. So thank you uh, to all of you. Um, I want to thank the audience for being engaged and taking the time from your hectic, you know, juggling COVID competing demands. I feel that this was so important to do. So thank you for your questions and uh, and actually for sharing uh, this this abridged conference with us. Please remember to complete your evaluations. Your feedback is so important. It informs what we will be doing in the future. And it's also the way you're going to get instructions on how to claim your main pro credits. So um, with that, I wanna thank everyone and, uh, uh, and ask you to have a safe day. And I'm gonna hand it over to David White for final words. Thank you very much, Viola. And um, it's quite classic for you that you've thanked everyone else. And so it's entirely appropriate that we take a moment to uh, thank you and celebrate uh, what you've done. So first of all, for all your work on the DFCM conference um, and uh, you've given credit to all the people who contributed. It, it takes someone to lead us and bring us all together and make the hard decisions and an extraordinary pivot to an amazingly successful uh, conference. Um, and I just want to add that uh, Dr. Kidd was in touch with you this morning and sent his regards and also credit uh, to you for uh, this organization. Um, you are coming to the end of a very successful five year term as uh, the program director for faculty development. And um, we need to acknowledge and celebrate uh, you for guiding and growing DFCM's faculty development uh, activity. Um, as, an, as a testament to the impressive amount and breadth of your work across the portfolio, uh, there have been some exciting developments. And when you pass the baton, it's not gonna be to one person. I, at last count, it was something like five people are gonna take on the portfolio. And it really doesn't reflect that, gee, you couldn't do it. It's that you've been doing it so well that um, it was recognized uh, broadly that not one person can do it all. It's grown to that degree, uh, thanks to uh, the, the way you go about it. Um, I want to add at a personal level, and I think in saying as I speak for many people, but I, I will say it personally, that it has been an absolute pleasure to work with you. We work very closely because you notionally report to me. Um, you bring passion and caring to all that you do. It's been on display this morning. 
Um, it's been incredible to witness your growth as an academic leader, not only in this portfolio, but over the course of an amazing career. And I'm sure that will continue. It was, no, <clears throat> I'll try to get through this. Uh, one of the most moving parts of the conference was when you um, took Kat Krieger's invitation um, to join in the Indigenous tradition of introducing yourself and telling us um, a bit more about where you come from. Um, the Indigenous tradition is that all of us, uh, over 200 people who were here today would have done it um, and we would have needed a three or four day conference to just do that part. Um, but learning more about you today was uh, helped to deepen our understanding um, and it takes courage and uh, open yourself up to do that. And I, I want to acknowledge that. There's more to come over the summer um, and uh, as you support people in uh, taking on their roles, but we are all deeply indebted to you. And um, I, I can hear thunderous applause as we wrap this up. Thank you, Yola. Thank you, David, for the kind words. Thanks, everyone. I think it's a wrap. A uh, great conference, uh, Viola. Thank you, um, and to our speakers. Just a fantastic day. The um, the uh, organization was excellent. So to our staff, thank you all very very much, and to the planning committee. And Kat, thank you. Uh, those are great uh, opening words that really established a, a great start to the day for us. So thank you. Um, thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you.